Okay. okay, folks. Well, welcome to welcome to politics in the park. Um, let me first of all acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Iowa Nation, and that uh, that acknowledgement is particularly apt given that we're talking tonight about the plight of another uh, indigenous people. Now, originally, uh, Anthony Lowenstein was billed to speak about the arms stroke peace settlement with the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Israel uh, to show that um, Trump could uh, completely redesign the Middle East. And uh, that, of course, has been uh, somehow in the distant past. I'm not saying that it's irrelevant, but the topic has been changed to, uh, I think I've got it correct, the, the West indifference to suffering, um, in particular reference to the people of Palestine. Anthony's given me the exact title, but I didn't. Okay. okay. <laughs> Um, most of you know who Anthony is. He's Woo! Been... <laughs> yeah. Okay, don't, don't let the applause go to his head too quickly. Uh, Anthony's had the courage to be an independent journalist for, for a long time. He's uh, published in just about every newspaper I can think of. Uh, he used to be a regular in a platform called New Matilda, no longer exists. He's written for The Guardian, for The Herald, for The New York Times. But more importantly, he's the author of half a dozen pretty significant books, beginning with My Israel Question, which I'm not going to attempt to summarize it, but except to say that uh, for me personally, it was uh, a very significant and brave book. And from there, he's gone on to look at, to write about disaster capitalism, the prophets of doom, the blogging revolution and um, powder pills and pills, powder and smoke. Powder pills, powder and smoke, which is his unmasking of the stupidity, I think, of the war of the of the war on drugs. So uh, they're all pretty significant volumes. I'm grateful to Anthony, and I'm very grateful that he's agreed to get the most one of the most important gigs of his life, uh, politics in the past night. <laughs> yes, you know, I was thinking on the way here that the last time I spoke at politics was in a different venue, A, and B was four, five, six years ago, anyway, I'm glad it's still going on. I'm wrapped to be here, so thank you guys for inviting me. Yes, yeah, so my original talk was going to be around the question of the glorious Trump peace deal last year in the Middle East. I will touch on that, but it, it actually I would argue has been as insignificant as you would imagine. But nonetheless, it is worth mentioning at some point. But clearly the last month, yet again, we've had a round of carnage and violence and awfulness in between Israel and Palestine. I think it's worth obviously commenting about that. And I want to talk a little bit about what I've been doing for the last five years, which is relevant because I was based in East Jerusalem for about four years, including in Sheikh Jarrah, which is the area where a lot of the Palestinian homes are being forcibly evicted at the moment and have been for at least 15 years. I wanted to say a few things initially, I guess, about what recently happened. And on one hand, there's not a lot to say. It's another round of the same thing we've seen for 15 or so years. There were provocations on the Israeli side, which is pretty much par for the course. And I want to talk a bit later about how the media covers this, because as a journalist, I'm consistently frustrated and disillusioned with how often the mainstream media, both here and overseas, covers this issue. Because too often this conflict, if you want to call it that, and it could be called a lot of other things, is reported in a way that somehow escalates during a flare-up of violence and then kind of dissipates when there's just sort of so-called normal low-level occupation. This is what happens every day. Every day there's violence and occupation. If you read 
a lot of the Israeli press or even Palestinian press or Arab press, you know that almost daily there's a Palestinian being killed by an Israeli force, usually in the West Bank, but sometimes also in Gaza and sometimes in Israel proper. That rarely makes the international media. And I think that speaks volumes about how we in the West often view this conflict, which is very much about how high is the death toll. And if it's a high enough death toll, then the media may well cover it. It doesn't always cover it anyway very well, and I'll get to that a bit later. So this recent round of stupidity, carnage, predictability, insanity, there are roughly 260 Palestinians killed, many people here will obviously know that, of which about 60 or so were children, there are roughly 12 or 13 Israeli civilians killed as well in Israel. And what became, I think, clear during this latest round is a few things I wanted to say. One, I think what's really changed in the last few years, and the last time there was a massive escalation was in 2014, uh, when there was well over uh, a 1,000 Palestinians killed. And a number of Israeli forces, when Israeli forces actually went into, on the ground into Gaza, which they did not do this time, is it's important to frame what actually happened here. And let me outline a few points. One, Israel has no interest in overthrowing Hamas, zero. If Israel wanted to overthrow Hamas, they could do it in a matter of days. And the reason I mention that, it's really important to understand why. It's like saying when the US went into Afghanistan and Iraq, Afghanistan 2001, Iraq 2003, within a matter of weeks, they've overthrown the Taliban and Saddam. Militarily, the US and Israel, for that matter, similarly, has no trouble, in inverted commas, overthrowing regimes. Militarily, they are second to none. The difference is when it comes to, say, Iraq and Afghanistan, obviously there has been a raging insurgency to this day. And in Gaza, Israel has no interest in overthrowing Hamas, and the Israeli press, the more succinct ones, will acknowledge this. There's no interest in overthrowing Hamas because Israel has no interest in even more controlling 2 million Palestinians. It's much more convenient to have the Hamas bogeyman down the road. Very convenient. And Hamas pose no existential threat to Israel whatsoever. Yes, they fire rockets, most of which are um, badly designed, go off anywhere, and de definitely do um, kill Israeli civilians, which I condemn. This idea somehow that we constantly read in the press that there's two equal sides, there's a fight to the death, and who knows who's going to win. The truth is, as I said, Israel has made a decision for years to not overthrow Hamas. And in fact, during the recent round, Netanyahu, who was then Prime Minister, who is still today, but may not be tomorrow, which I'll get to in a minute. Woo! Well, the guy who's going to replace him is actually worse, but we'll get to that in a second. Is that ultimately there's a real... Netanyahu, in fact, flirted with the idea of saying, maybe we'll reoccupy Gaza. That was his words. And to be clear, Israel has always occupied Gaza. In 2005, they removed Israeli settle, settlers and settlements. And having been to Gaza a number of times in the last 15 years, you can still even to this day visit where the Israeli settlers used to live. There are these, obviously not in very good shape anymore, but there are tennis courts that settlers used to um, play on, literally on the edge of the Mediterranean. I mean, it's a beautiful setting. So the settlers' life was pretty good. The settlers were removed in 2005. But Israel has maintained to this day air, sea, and land control. So Gaza is not an independent state. And this room will know that. But so often in the international press, that is either ignored or forgotten. So the idea somehow that Israel wants to overthrow Hamas, they do not. So essentially we have this absurdly uneven, I don't even know what the word is, conflict, battle, whatever the word, I mean, I often don't even know what word to actually use, where Israel knows that it can sustain a hell of a lot of damage within Gaza. And there's a term that Israelis military use often, which some of you may have heard of, which is called mowing the lawn. It's often said in the Israeli press, and some military figures will say it too, which essentially means that every few years 
five years, two years, six years, whatever it may be, Israel has to go into Gaza and just sort of take care of things, deter Hamas for a while until they can rearm and then come back for another round. I mean, it's a deeply racist, offensive term, obviously, but it's actually disturbingly accurate to how Israel views Gaza. They need to go in, in their thinking, relatively regularly, as I said, it's been since 2014, but to be clear, Israel has been bombing Gaza almost weekly for years. So although there has not been a massive escalation as there was a few weeks ago, they are bombing Gaza all the time and killing civilians all the time. And they are restricting Palestinian ability to leave Gaza all the time, as a minority is Egypt, which is equally complicit in the siege of Gaza, a nice, cuddly client state of the US and Israel. Despite the fact that you read recently when they were negotiating a, a ceasefire, Egypt plays a role there and proudly says, you know, it's thanks to us there's a ceasefire. Well, sure, but ultimately Egypt is not equally complicit, but is complicit in the fact that the siege has been going on Gaza for 15 years. So Israel goes into Gaza in a massive way every three years, five years, seven years, whenever it may be, and destroys huge amounts of infrastructure and what you often find in the more astute Israeli press, often in Hebrew, which is not translated, is the thinking behind this, and even a few weeks ago, Benny Gantz, who is the Defence Minister of Israel, said, our aim, and I'm paraphrasing here, our aim in Gaza is to not have a complete humanitarian disaster, but to keep them in kind of a state of crisis. That's the aim. And years ago, and WikiLeaks partly revealed some of this amongst other sources a number of years ago too, that said literally Israeli officials were counting the number of calories that were allowed to enter Gaza for Gazans to eat. People can Google it, it sounds kind of crazy and inhumane. It's all there, it's all real, it's insane. And yet this is what is going on all the time. So the idea somehow that our media regularly reports about the conflict mostly only when there is an escalation shows how often we're not hearing about the situation every day, every week, regularly, which shows that people's lives in Gaza are unbelievably difficult. So we have a situation now where, again, the most astute Israeli media and politicians are saying, in the recent round, Israel didn't, in inverted commas, win. And what, you know, like, what did they win in this situation? I mean, no one wins in a war, to be clear. No one wins. But ultimately, who, ulti who comes out of this latest round in better shape? Hamas is left standing. Hamas is seen by many Palestinians, though far from all, as having defended Al-Aqsa, the third holiest site in Islam, which is based in Jerusalem. Now, Hamas is not based particularly there, but they were seen as the only ones who could defend Al-Aqsa from what seemed to be an increasing Israeli police presence around the mosque. And it's clearly clear on this, many Palestinians do not like Hamas. I'm not here to you know, idealise Hamas. I wouldn't want, you know, wouldn't want to live under Hamas's rule. Hamas are a, are a, it's a police state in Gaza. There's no question about that. That, to me, is deeply problematic. And the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank are also a police state. So Palestinians themselves have very few good political options. That is a sad reality, which I'll get to a bit later. But for many people in the last month, the only political force that was seen to potentially defend Palestinian rights was Hamas. Doesn't mean all Palestinians support them, but it means they were seen as the only political force that came out and said, if you guys cross the line, if you guys start to attack Al-Aqsa, which is what Israel did, we will fight back. And it's important also to note that compared to the last war in Gaza, we now have a new US president, the nice, shiny Joe Biden. Now, we all love Uncle Joe. We don't really, but Uncle Biden Joe. President. <laughs> Sorry. And what I think is so interesting about the recent upsurge in violence is that although, predictably, Biden was supportive of Israel, refused to call a ceasefire, put pressure on Israel for a ceasefire. That was all to be expected. If anyone knows anything about Biden's history for 50 years, he is deeply pro-Israel. But what has changed, and did change this time, publicly, not just privately, are two things. 
one, a growing vocal section of the Democratic Party which is openly critical both of Israel and their own president. It's a minority of Democrats. I'm not talking about the vast majority of Democrats still support Israel. There's no question about that. But you have now high-profile, prominent Democrats, AOC, Ilan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, who's Palestinian herself with family in the West Bank, who openly come out and are saying... And about Well, you mean Kamala Harris. Well, she's pretty pro-Israel too, by the way. No. Um, but... There is, I think, a, a shift, and there's no doubt behind the scenes so that I understand that although Biden is not going to suddenly change his spots at 78 years old, he knew that there is a shift going on within his own party, like a lot of issues, not least climate change and others. And I think he felt a degree that, because if Trump was president, this all would have been going on for a month, if not more. So I'm not giving Biden credit for how the war ended in a week, I'm saying that it would have been far worse had it been Trump. It would have gone longer. And two, I think there is a really significant shift going on within the Democratic Party. And the third, I think, aspect of it is that there is a much more organised um, Arab, Muslim, Palestinian community in the US that is far more vocal, politically savvy, and able to put pressure on the politicians. Now, this community has been around obviously for forever, but I think there is a shift going on in the idea that I think more and more people in those communities will not accept that their government, and many people I might add who would have voted for Joe Biden last November because they could never vote for Trump, are deeply unhappy and angry with the fact that their tax dollars are supporting what's going on. And fourthly, and which I think is fascinating, there is a clear generational shift going on with the American Jewish community. This is happening. You don't see it so much here, sadly. There obviously are Australian Jews who are against what's going on, including some in this room, and that's great, and myself, but that's relatively small, sadly. You don't see yet, as you're seeing in the US and the UK, a real generational shift. And let me just briefly explain what that means practically. You can argue in a way it hasn't directly impacted US foreign policy because growing numbers of young Jews opposed Israel doesn't therefore mean that US foreign policy changes. No, not yet. But what is happening is that many, many young Jews, some of whom were brought up like I was, I grew up in Melbourne, in a Zionist home, in a belief that Israel should be supported, the argument that says... Um, God forbid there's another Holocaust, we have somewhere to go. I was told that when I was growing up for years, and I've written about it for a long time. And many Jews now in 2021 are still being told that. That hasn't changed. What has changed in many young Jewish communities is this idea somehow that young Jews are being told they have to make a deal with the devil. And what I mean by that is that they're essentially being told that to be Jewish, to be acceptably Jewish, to be responsibly Jewish... You need to be uncritical towards Israel, regardless of what it is. <coughs> and for a lot of Jews, though not all, who have either been there, sometimes on, you guys may have heard of this birthright uh, trip. Birthright is a trip that was started a number of years ago by Sheldon Adelson, who just died this year. He's a multi billionaire, um, well, casino mogul actually, who was also insanely pro Israel. And he funded this program that for years, and continues to this day, sends lots, probably I'm, I'm a bit of hold because of COVID, but it's been going for years, sends lots and lots of young Jews every year for a 10-day trip to Israel. And his main aim, apart from obviously the hope that they come back loving Israel, it's a free trip. The aim also is, he, and he said this very openly, he wants to make sure that A, they're pro-Israel, and B, that they do not end up marrying non-Jews. He says that openly. Well, he's obviously passed away now, but that, that's a key aim of the, of the program. So the thought being, being that you go to Israel, you have an amazing time, you meet lovely people, men, women, you know, whatever you're into, and then when you come back to the US, you are in love both with Israel and your own community. And to some extent, that worked for a while of sorts. 
But what has increasingly been happening in the last, say, five or so years is that you have a lot of young Jews who are going on these prep trips and they're kind of, what's the best way to put it, kind of screwing with it. Meaning that they're often filming themselves asking questions to their hosts, their guides, sort of saying, well, what about the occupation? What about the West Bank? What about Palestine? What about where our US tax dollars is going? Why are we doing this? And it's a minority of people doing it. I'm not saying they all are. But that's actually a really important shift. And the impact of that has led to, amongst other things, a range of quite large now high-profile I guess you call them dissident Jewish groups in the US, Jewish Voice for Peace, if not now, and others, that are mostly made up of younger Jews who are saying that there's not necessarily a sort of a party line, so to speak, but many of them are very critical of Israel, against the occupation, many of them are anti-Zionists, many of them support BDS, boycott, divestment, sanctions against Israel, not everybody, but many. And I think what that shows is that there is that generational gap which is happening, which is so important. Without that generational shift, this will not change. And ultimately, the only way that Israel has been able to continue what it's doing for decades, the key country here is not Israel, it's the US. It always has been. I remember Gideon Levy, the amazing Israeli journalist in Israel, who would sort of say, and I'm paraphrasing him, if America wants any occupation tomorrow, it would happen in a few days. It's also a bit more complicated than that, but it would end quickly. America's made a decision, and this is not just the Jewish community, but a lot of politicians in Congress are not Jewish at all, who support Israel for a range of reasons. The Israel lobby is one factor, but there are others. I think my sense has often been that for a lot of politicians, including here in Australia, that there is a... The reason I think many of them support Israel, I think people often mistakenly believe that because the pro-Israel lobby visits them or takes them on a free trip to Israel, therefore they support Israel. It's a factor. It's a factor. But there's two other, I think, key reasons I've often thought. One, I think it's partly because a lot of politicians, those in the media, have an innate sympathy for Jews because of the Second World War, because of the Holocaust. And although that was a long time ago, I think there is still this sense that how dare many in the world try to go after the one Jewish state. So I'm not articulated that way, although some do. And I think the second key reason is 9-11 has been unbelievably beneficial to Israel, hugely beneficial to Israel, to the point where literally a few days after 9-11, Netanyahu, who was then not Prime Minister, I think he's on CNN, and one of the American news channels basically says, again, I'm paraphrasing, this is great for Israel. And let me explain what he means by that. I think what he meant was that now, and he was right, frankly, now the West will understand what Israel has been doing for years. The only way that you guys in the West will understand what Israel is going through is to fight a never-ending brutal war on terror against Muslims and Arabs. It's the only way. This is how the thinking goes. And as we know, much of the West was very happy to go along with that line. They've done that for 20 odd years and we're still in a never ending war on terror. So much of the West has adopted the Israeli framework, mindset, and language. And it's always amazing if you even if you go back to read Pity the Nation, the great book by the late Robert Fisk, and that was two that's talking about the Lebanese war long before 9-11. And obviously Israel had a key role in that, they're not the only one. What's amazing if you reread that now in the context of a post-9-11 world. So much of the language and way in which Israel was fighting that war and the language that we're using is exactly what the US has been saying for 20 years in its war on terror. In other words, so much of the US global battlefield, Iran, Afghanistan, Libya and beyond, is not solely coined by Israel, no, but it's certainly influenced by them. And you know that for a few reasons. One, because since 9-11, the US and Israel have arguably never been closer. And that's been developed in a range of ways, diplomatically, politically, and others. And I think also the language that the US and many advocates of the war on terror are using is remarkably similar to what Israel's been doing long before 9-11. So there's a great sort of ideological symbiosis, I would say, between those two states. So despite all that, there are cracks appearing. 
So yes, that sounds pretty green, but actually there is a shift going on. And that's not just generationally in terms of American Jews, but also the idea that growing numbers of young Americans in general, there's been recent polling, not even since the recent conflict, but this year, which finds that growing numbers of Democrats in some polls and majority have far more sympathy to Palestinians and Israelis. Not all, but many. Growing numbers of Democrats support BDS as a policy. Now, clearly, that's not going to happen under Joe Biden, but there is a real change going on. There's a shift going on that a lot of Americans are saying, why is our country funding, supporting, arming Israel more than any other nation in the world, which is the case? The US, Israel gets roughly, no one actually even knows the exact amount, anywhere between three to five billion dollars a year. It has been the case for decades now. So, on the one hand, you could see what happened in the last few weeks and come away feeling deeply depressed. On the one level, you should be. The carnage, the complete destruction. I have a number of friends in Gaza who I've spent time with when I've been there over the years, and they're thankfully okay. But during the conflict, they were sending me videos and photos that they were either shooting themselves or people close to them that filmed. And some of the images you can imagine were horrific. They were you know, dead children, dead families. Um, it was really horrible. And if you haven't been to Gaza, it's probably hard to imagine what it's like. On one level, it's an incredibly beautiful place. It is on the Mediterranean. It's incredibly lush on the one hand. On the other hand, it's also incredibly poor. Um, the majority of Gazans drink polluted water because there's no access to clean water. They are constantly surveilled above. Whenever you're there, you hear uh, Israeli drones 24-7 above you. They are, as I said before, shut in on all sides. They can't really leave from the Egyptian side or the Israeli side. I just read today, in fact, that, you know, so much of the, if a Gazan has cancer, needs treatment, they routinely cannot get that treatment in Gaza because that equipment is not there have to go into Israel. And routinely, Israel blocks that access. So there are unbelievable numbers of Gaza men, women and kids who cannot get out, who don't get out, who can't get the treatment they need and they die. Happens all the time, all the time. And that's actually been worsened apparently in the last month since the recent conflict. Let me just say a few things about the situation in Sheikh Jarrah, which is relevant to the recent conflict, and I was living there for a number of years. Um, so Sheikh Jarrah is a neighbourhood in East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem is an occupied territory, um, occupied by Israel since 1967, and I was living there with my family um, in a Palestinian home. Palestinians live in the front, and we were renting from them at the back. And down the road from where we were living, we would regularly see in fact, almost every other day, Israeli police harassing, humiliating, racially profiling Palestinians, mostly young men, although not all, 15-year-olds, 20-year-olds, all the time. And the impact of seeing that, obviously this wasn't directed at me, I wasn't the, you know, the racism wasn't towards me as some Jewish, I'm not an Israeli citizen, just to put that on the record clearly, although I could become a citizen as a Jew. Every Jew has the right for those who don't know, to arrive in Israel tomorrow. And if you can prove that you are Jewish through a range of ways, you get a passport. That's how it works. Whereas Palestinians who have, in my view, far more connection to the land and far more right to do so cannot get a Palestinian or Israeli passport. It's outrageous, outrageous discrimination. And I would sometimes, I mean, remember I was there in 2009, I um, mean, one of these, uh, down the road from where I would live a number of years later, you know, where, I, where I would walk quite regularly on the way to a, a shop in East Jerusalem, you know, we were living there. And we were seeing, I saw at the time, because I was there on my own for work in 2009, a Palestinian family who had been forcibly kicked out to make room for fundamentalist Jewish settlers. And I remember this image, it's always stuck with me. There was a Palestinian family all this stuff was on the pavement outside their home. Three of the people were literally sitting on a couch. They had nowhere to go. And inside this home, there were, and they are 
this people are still there to this day because I would regularly go past to sort of see if they were still there. Fundamentalist Jewish settlers, some of whom are from Sydney or Brooklyn or wherever it may be. And the reason I think this is significant to say is that I think many times people rightly focus on the West Bank and Gaza, as they should. But what's happening in parts of Jerusalem is arguably as important. And for those who don't know, just briefly, there's West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. In general, West Jerusalem is where most Israeli Jews live, and in general, East Jerusalem is where most Palestinians live. In general. There's not quite as neat as that, but that's a general summary. But what's happened in the last years is what Israel is trying to do very clearly is to bring more and more fundamentalist Jews into East Jerusalem and essentially change the demographic mix. And these people often who have been brought in are either, as I said, Israeli settlers, they're either Jews from the other side of the world who come to Israel and think they have the God-given right, and they will say that they do, to live in this particular area. And... What was so, um, well, striking, depressing, and revealing, and this is one of the things that has deeply frustrated me about so much the media coverage of this issue, and I've talked a lot about this in the last few weeks, whenever I had the chance to do so, so much of the coverage globally about this conflict, not just about Gaza or Sheikh Sharada or Jerusalem, is it... I don't know if it's willful or otherwise. It's hard. I can't get inside the mind of other journalists, thankfully. But I think there is a willful um, ignoring of what has happened to Israeli society in the last 20 years. A lot of these abuses have been going on for 70 years, so I'm not ignoring that for a second. But there's something has changed in the last 20, 25 years. And what's changed is that a Jewish supremacy ideology is now in the ascendancy. Not every Israeli Jew thinks like that, they don't. It's a visible, vocal, powerful minority who have arguably taken over the state. And I say that because you now have, in the West Bank, for example, 750,000 Jewish settlers living there, all illegally, and that's irreversible. They're not going anywhere. You're not going to remove 750,000 people. That's the point. Where, where are they going to go? How's that going to work? It's, in other words, the occupation is permanent. Now, when I say that, I don't mean to suggest that nothing can ever change. I don't mean it like that. I mean that the idea somehow that facts on the ground can be reversed or changed when you have that many people in the West Bank, let alone elsewhere, is living in a fantasy land. So the two-state solution died arguably as soon as it was born, which is, well, 25 or so years ago. And it's important to say that because still there is kind of a, I call it, it's like a two-state cult. And everyone, a lot of people want to be in this peace process cult. And what I mean by that is that you will hear constantly, regardless of what happens, regardless of how many people are killed or maimed or occupied or whatever, you will still find US presidents, Australian leaders, politicians, those in the media saying, well, if only you got back in the room, we could maybe have a two-state solution. I mean, this is, this is sort of the Stockholm Syndrome. There is no other way to describe it. It's done. It's not happening. Putting aside the fact that you have all these facts on the ground that make it impossible, there is no interest and political will on the most powerful side, Israel, to do so. And what seems to be happening this week, as I'm sure some of you will be aware, is Netanyahu maybe possibly appears to be leaving the stage. Don't want to speak too soon because he is a political political survivor, animal, lunatic. So who knows what's going to happen? But probably will be leaving the stage soon to be replaced by Naftali Bennett. Let me just give you a bit of a taste of the great new Israeli, likely new prime minister. He's more extreme than Netanyahu. He's more ideological. He has more of a bloodlust. I think there's no question about that. He has openly boasted about killing Arabs. He used to be in the military years ago. He used to live in the West Bank, but no longer does. And one thing that is, so that's depressing. But what's been so revealing about this moment, as there seems to be a political shift going on, is this. 
So many Jewish groups, and often I read about what they say and what they think and what they're worried about is they know Netanyahu is politically toxic. He is so inverted commas, destroyed the Israeli brand for so many years, they've been dying for someone different to come on the stage. And who are they likely to get? Someone who is even more extreme. And I think it's important to say that because this will hopefully, don't be too optimistic about this, but hopefully will challenge this idea that it actually matters who runs Israel. Of course, if you know Gideon Levy was Prime Minister tomorrow, that'd be great, but not that likely meaning that pretty much every senior Israeli political leader who has any chance of being Prime Minister, on the issue that matches the occupation, they all are fundamentally in agreement with each other. They all agree. The occupation is not going to win. It's permanent. We have the right to control 5 million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. This is, this is the ideology. So without outside pressure, you know, the analogy with South Africa is relevant here because, as anyone would know, white South Africans didn't suddenly wake up in 1994 and went, gee, things aren't that good, we better change, I don't know. The only reason, amongst others, this, re this country, that country shifted was outside pressure, not just talking about boycotts, a range of reasons, political pressure, diplomatic pressure, whatever. <coughs> Israel is exactly the same. If we're waiting for an Israeli Jewish population to sort of rise up and change the status quo, it ain't going to happen. There is an Israeli left. About 20 of them, <laughs> maybe 30. And they do some amazing work, I'm being facetious. Obviously, there is an Israeli anti occupation group of people. Obviously, there are, but they're tiny. And there's not enough, you know, there's, there's no conceptual way that they can seriously change the situation. Now, anyone you speak to amongst that group will say, we need outside support, we need outside pressure. Whatever that looks like. Could be boycotts, could be military um, boycotts, it could be a range of things. And now the Palestinians will say exactly the same thing. I mean, the, the, there's such a profoundly uneven difference of power here. And this brings me, should I finish soon? I don't want to keep on talking about it. Excuse me, okay. Let me briefly talk about the media, my favorite subject. So in the last month or so, when this recent upsurge began, I, with about four other journalists, we released a statement, which you can find online, called Do Better on Palestine. It essentially was a simple statement that said that too often the media reports this issue as two equal sides, where it's not. And this whole issue kind of went a bit viral. It got a lot of attention. You know, um, the head of ABC was asked about it in Senate estimates. It kind of went a little bit crazy, which was good. And... <laughs> What's, I think, revealing about that is this, that there were pressure, we know this, on particularly young people of colour journalists at SBS and ABC. Their jobs were threatened. They were told to take the names of this statement. And the statement you can see online, I can assure you, is pretty mild. We're not talking about some radical statement. It's not at all. So there was pressure on these young people to remove their names. Some didn't, some didn't. But I think it shows a fundamental shift in how many of the media view this. Although, yes, there was a lot of pressure from senior management at SBS and ABC, for sure, but huge numbers of journalists signed this statement. And you can see the list online. Some are actively day-to-day -day news, some are more commentators, some are sort of cultural figures, various people, and not just the so-called usual suspects. And the reason I think that's important is there is an increasing, I think, appetite and demand that reporting on this issue, how it's been for years, is no longer acceptable. I'm not calling, the statement doesn't call, for one-side propaganda. I'm not arguing for that at all. But we are saying it's important that people recognise there is not two equal sides in this conflict. And it's finally on this point. And the logical extension of that is that emerged this week that the ABC has sent out a directive to its journalists they're not allowed to use the word apartheid when describing what's happening in Israel-Palestine. Now, why this statement particularly was released, I can't get inside the mind of, thankfully, ABC management. I suspect, I suspect it was because, a few things, briefly, a few months ago, some will be aware, Human Rights Watch put out a report which said what a lot of Palestinians have been saying for a long time, which was what Israel is doing is apartheid. And therefore, there are certain um, reactions that need to happen 
punishment, sanctions, etc. Last week's Q&A had an interesting discussion to show that one should generally avoid, but now and then it's interesting. And last week they had Aranda Abdul Fattah, who's a Palestinian Australian, talking about this question. The word apartheid came up a thousand times because she raised it. And my sense is that there is a, um, and I put this politely, a, a political pressure on public broadcasters can work, meaning that bosses at SBS and ABC, who have a lot of problems, which I won't get into right now, know that if they report on this conflict in a particular way, they are harassed and bullied for months and months and months by senior people in the Israel lobby and others in the Jewish community. So often it's easier in their mind to not go there, to not go down the path. Because what the ABC had said in this directive was, we shouldn't use the term apartheid because that references South Africa. As if somehow that's the only acceptable use of that word, it's kind of crazy. So let me leave it there, and I have a thousand things more to say, but I'll stop. Okay, we've got plenty minutes for questions. Can you make sure that you ask a question and um, not try to avoid repeating your your understanding of the Middle East. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. You should give a bit of report on uh, Palestinian side. But I, I want to call attention to something not many people could might be aware of. One is that Palestinians are second to third class citizens in Arab countries where they seek refuge. And we don't hear any bit about it. Second is, we're aware that also Jewish money in the US and Arab money in the Middle East mixed together in the financial markets, investing in the same companies, banks. And third is, we have to understand that the Muslim world is not, not one, it's divided. Iran supports uh, Palestinians and their what, Shia, the minority. And it's also to their best interest that uh, there is conflict because it also helps <laughs> raise oil prices. So what's your comment on that angle of the Middle East conflict? Thank you. I guess the original um, topic would have touched on some of those questions, but let me briefly say a few words. I am under no illusion about the role of many Arab states towards Palestinians. They sold them out years ago, continue to sell them out, and the so-called Trump-Abraham Accords that happened in the second half of last year was a continuation of that. And all these states signed inverted commas peace deals with Israel, where essentially they are weapons deals. These countries were desperate for Israeli and US technology, surveillance, etc., some of which they've now got, not all. And it's important, obviously, to say this, but let me say it anyway. Clearly, there's a difference between the Arab regimes and the Arab people. Not that one can generalize, obviously, there's no homogenous Arab people, but in general, in most Arab Muslim countries, Palestinians are hugely supported. That's fairly uncontroversial to say. Not everyone, but most people do. And they are profoundly angry with the fact that their regimes, many of whom I might add are backed by the US, support Israel, more and more so. Um, I think the role of uh, many Arab states in the last month has been quite revealing because what you saw were large protests for Palestinians in many Arab countries. You saw a great deal of expressed disappointment, contempt, frustration with the fact that some of their regimes had backed support of Israel last year. And many Arab regimes don't, don't just lack legitimacy, they're petrified of their own ass being kicked. 
I mean, that's the sad reality. They are scared of their own people. We're not going to come out and say that, obviously, but they are. There's the only reason you build an incredibly sophisticated, brutal police state is to repress people who might come after you, which is normally your own people. So what's happening in Egypt or Saudi, countries I've been to, I've visited, I've reported on both those countries, Jordan, a lot of countries in the Middle East, Iran I've been to and reported on, not particularly about the Palestinian issue per se, but I've been to all these places to report on conflict there or other questions, that the leaders are well aware that they have to at least give some lip service to supporting Palestine. So for example, in the last few weeks, despite some of these states having made peace deals with Israel, came out very clearly and said, because they had to, to appease their people's anger, we support the Palestinians' right to do whatever. And I'm paraphrasing a more nuanced argument. And finally, the question of Iran. Well, look, Iran uh, has its own interesting role. I would say, I mean, I'm not really, yeah, look, when it comes to the Palestinian people, Iran's role is often seriously exaggerated. I mean, yes, Hamas has got some support from Iran over the years, but Iran is not directing Hamas fighters. They're not directing what Hamas does during the recent conflict. They have more influence with Hezbollah, obviously in Lebanon, to be sure. Um, Iran is, has funded Hezbollah, has often helped them arm. And I think there is no doubt there is an attempt by Israel and many US allies in the region to try to suffocate Iran because Iran is the only potentially serious big threat to their own influence. So the reason this whole argument for years now about Iran's alleged desire for nuclear weapons, which as far as we know they do not have, is not really about the fact that I, I, mean, I think the whole region should be nuclear free. So my view is there should be no nuclear weapons in any country. It doesn't matter who they are. I think nuclear weapons shouldn't exist, full stop. But the so-called fear that many Arab states in Israel have for Iran having a nuclear weapon is that that deterrent suddenly disappears as soon as Iran has what Israel has. Israel has anywhere between one to 200 nuclear weapons and has for decades. That's, a, that's the biggest open secret in the Middle East. And one of the people who revealed that, Mordechai Benunu, who's an amazing Israeli um, dissident, who was in jail for 18 years, who I used to see regularly walking around East Jerusalem, he's out of prison now, he's not allowed to leave the country. He, we, no, Israel refuses to give him a passport. So I mention that because the nuclear question is routinely used I'm not saying by you, but used by many in the media when this issue comes up about Iran and Israel. That Israel, in my view, should not fear Iranian invasion or attack. Not because, to be clear, I'm a fan of the Iranian regime. I am not. I've spent time there. I've got I've reported from there. It's a horribly repressive state. I'm not de defending Iran at all. But I do think that there is a fundamentally dishonest perception of many in the media and the political elite that says somehow that Israel must do what it has to do regardless of how it harms Palestinians to protect itself against Iranian aggression. I just don't buy that argument. Okay, Alex. You say if you go to Gaza and look around, I was in Israel on a study tour a few years ago, and we spent all day at the Gaza border, but we could not get in. Has that situation changed? Now that's only a small question. No, However, it's a short answer, but I'll say more than that. Coming to what's going on right now, I agree with you about Natalie Bennett being to the far right of Netanyahu. But on the other hand, Netanyahu actually should have been in jail a long time ago. And is it not feasible that Bennett and his 
other possible co conspirators is who are wanting to get power away from Netanyahu may get to get together and fairly soon they won't be able to work together and there will be another election but at least we'll get rid of bloody Netanyahu. <laughs> <laughs> Do you agree? Okay. <laughs> I'll answer the first question first. So has it changed again to Gaza? Absolutely not. No, it hasn't changed. In fact, virtually nobody, I mean, putting aside what happened in the last month, but aside from that, during the conflict, no one was being brought into Gaza, journalists or anyone else. But in the so-called normal day, today, tomorrow, next week, virtually no one is getting into Gaza. Yes, some journalists can. Yes, some aid workers can. Yes, some in the UN can. But in general, it's sealed. It hasn't changed. Israeli Jews can't get in. Um, that's been the case for 15 years now. So it's... I'm not an Israeli Jew. You won't, you won't get in, sadly. Well, maybe not sadly. In terms of the other question, look, um, Naftali Bennett, maybe in a deal with you know, Lapid, who is who calls himself a centrist, but realistically on the occupation is awful and right-wing and racist, as they all are, sadly. Would it be good to get rid of Netanyahu? Absolutely. I'm not minimising that. And he is on trial for corruption and he may end up going to jail. I mean, who knows? It's quite, it's possible. Yeah. Israel has a long history of imprisoning its former prime ministers and presidents from corruption to rape and honour. This is quite a quite weird, quite unique in, a, in, the, in the so-called Western nations for so many former leaders to end up in prison. That's a whole, that's a whole separate question. <laughs> But, and there could be a fifth election in the space of two years, but you can keep having elections over and over and over again. Virtually every election has had virtually exactly the same result. The largest party was still the Kud. Netanyahu's party got the highest number of votes. He hasn't formed a government and he may well be out of power tomorrow, but his party received the highest number of seats by far. Now, would a replacement leader in the Athenian Army they could do better or worse? Who knows? But again, this to me almost is beside the point because ultimately what matters surely is that the main players who will form government to be prime minister or defence minister, on the key issue of the occupation, the siege of Gaza, there's no difference. The differences are nuanced. The differences are minimal. So, doesn't matter if it's a fifth or sixth or seventh election when something, someone similar appears. No, because ultimately, well, I can assure you, while there's election chaos, the settlements are expanding and more people are being brought in. That's what's happening every day. So the settlers don't really care if there's seven, eight, nine, ten elections. Their aim is for one to two million settlers in the coming 10 or 15 years. And on the current rate, they will succeed. That's what matters to me in the end. Yes, it matters who runs the country, but if you're doing the same thing with Netanyahu, then really, what difference does it make? I would argue. Um, Thanks, Anthony. Uh, I'm, my name's Iger and I'm an Australian Sri Lankan Tamil and I'm really interested in this external pressure um, proposition um, and I suppose it relates very much to what's happened to the Tamils in Sri Lanka, this um, slow progressive genocide that culminated in mass slaughter in 2009 and now an ongoing uh, process of military occupation and resettlement. Um, and I'm wanting to hear your thoughts on, you know, we've seen millions of people around the world mobilised, you know, in, in countries, out on the streets, um, and what you think the influence of that has been in, in the events that subsequently eventuated, um, and what we can potentially, I guess, as Tamils also learn around that in using, you know, we're having to rely now on external pressure because, you know, the Sri Lankan government, you know, will never be accountable to what they're doing. Uh, and what they've done, 
um, the international community has also constantly let us down. So what can we do now from an external pressure proposition? Palestinians, Sri Lankans, I've got friends from the Filipino community here as well. Um, and then maybe sort of lead into, you know, how we can bring about that when, you know, governments are acting based very much on their own geopolitical, economic interests and how we as, you know, ordinary citizens can bring about change and, and external pressure to, to, you know, get governments to act based on human rights and you know, on moral grounds more so. Yeah. I wish that happens sooner rather than later as well. Um, and one that was actually quite a hard question to answer, let me briefly explain why. On the one hand, there's no doubt that there is a growing international support for Palestinians and the Palestinian right to self-determination, whatever that looks like. One state, two states, my view is one state, but ultimately, People there have to decide that, not me sitting in Sydney. I think it should be a one state with everyone having democratic rights, whether you're Jewish, Christian, Palestinian, Muslim, whatever you may be. I do think in the US, where the debate is going, the country that arguably matters the most, is probably a sense of, and this is I'm talking about people like the Rashida Talibs of this world who are trying to, they realise they're not going to cut US support for Israel tomorrow. It's not going to happen. And what they could do, and that's already been tabled more seriously, is you curtail or you uh, challenge US military aid. In other words, you say there's a bill in Congress at the moment um, which essentially says that our US tax dollars should not be funding the imprisonment and torture of children, for example. It seems pretty uncontroversial, but does not have the majority of Congress behind it. It has a number of, a growing number of politicians. So, on the one hand, I think to imagine a profound transformation overnight will not happen. On the other hand, I think it's important that there is politicians in the US at least who are supported, who believe in actually using the leverage that the US clearly has to challenge that. And I mean, Joe Biden, to put it mildly, is an imperfect messenger, to put it mildly. But within his own party, as I said before, there is a major shift going on. And the democratic establishment knows that and they're scared. And you saw that, as I mentioned during my talk, to some extent, in the last conflict. I think what can be done here is on one level more complex. I do still think, and this, this was borne out even more recently by another public opinion poll about public Australian attitudes towards Palestine, which showed in the last 10 years a real shift towards much more support for Palestinians. There is a real change going on. And I often actually wonder where that comes from, in a way, because it's not really coming from what their people are seeing on their TVs or what they're hearing from their politicians. So where are they getting it from? I mean, you could say social media and their friends, and that's probably true, but there is a shift going on. And I think that's important. So to me, what should be done is I think there needs to be far, far more pressure on Australian politicians to have to answer serious questions about their support for Israel critically. There needs to be serious pressure on political parties to cut military ties. And Australia has deep ties with, for example, Israeli weapons companies like Elbert, amongst others. And most Australians wouldn't know that. And I think that needs to be highlighted far more. There aren't that many Israeli settlement products being sold at your local coals. There might be a few, but in general, that problem is far more in the US and the UK and Europe. I'm not saying we shouldn't boycott those products, you should, but they're generally not hugely big in Australia. There's definitely Israeli settlement wine, but that's mostly sold at your Zionist groceries in Bondi rather than your average, you know, Coles maybe in Dulwich Hill or whatever. As far as I know, I've never, I look sometimes at bottle shops to see if they sell Israeli settlement wine. And often, we were even, you know, people we living in Israel, Palestine, I should say. And we generally never bought wine from Israel because often you didn't know where it was from. Is it from Israel itself or is it from the West Bank? So it's easy just to not have Israeli wine at all. I mean, again, here that's not a massive, generally that sort of wine is not hugely um, popular or available. 
And I think what you do find more and more, which is really inspiring to me, and this does scare Israel a lot, is the growing solidarity between Black Lives Matter movements throughout the world in whatever guise that it takes and the Palestinian struggle. You saw that in the US and here for that matter, between prominent Black Lives Matter protests, a lot of BLM activists have been to Palestine in the last five years, they've seen the connections between how the US polices its um, people of colour and how Israel polices its own Palestinians. There are definite ties, connections, solidarities. That is, they, they, those are ties that definitely should be built on and they are being built on. I guess I'll leave it at that, maybe. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. We have to we have to roll it up because something of enormous Australian significance is about to invade the this forum, namely a trivia quiz, and we're, we're obliged to uh, uh, to keep to the schedule. Look, Anthony, you've given us a great overview. Um, I think the reference to Tamils, maybe the, maybe the reference to support from indigenous Australians as well, let alone Palestinian Australians. Yeah. Um, so the, that important question um, suggests the potential for considerable alliance if we can get our act together. And in that respect, <laughs> in that respect, in, in two weeks time, in, well, if you're fatalistic and think that nothing can be done, then you might as well spend your time worrying about whether there's going to be a special on pork chops and coals. Listen, no, don't, don't, don't say make... for the trivia, please. Okay. You can't give Anthony all the questions. Oh, no. It's only one uh, speaker. Hey, hey, hey. Next, in two weeks' time, to uh, should satisfy everybody. It usually goes for like an hour longer. No. Two speakers. Sorry. It's things amiss. I'll explain afterwards why. No, no. No, no. Um, Why can't take a couple more in, questions? In two weeks' sure. time, the topic is the boycott, the effectiveness and the merits and the prospects of the boycott investment sanctions system uh, campaign. And both and both speakers uh, will be Palestinians. Um, the last thing to say is thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you write. And... Um, May we continue to support the, uh, the Palestinian cause? Three, three questions. That's all. Are you kidding? What a joke! What a joke, Frank.